third Sunday of Advent tells us to rejoice. It's called Gaudete Sunday from the Latin to rejoice, the Latin imperative. If the vestments are available, the priest sometimes replaces his violet this week with rose. The dull purple atmosphere of penance and preparation is lightened, as it were, with light as we catch a glimpse of the wonderful season of Christmas, which, which we are awaiting. If you mix a bit of white with purple, I believe it becomes rose, some kind of rose. If we are living the season of Advent as preparation, this interlude becomes real respite. As we remember that we already know the end of the story. Jesus, the light of the world, has come. Indeed, joy to the world. The church is gentle here in its seasonal pilgrimage towards Christmas. We mourn sin and suffering in a world that is not yet truly fixed. But Christians share a joy which cannot be taken away, the joy of the gospel. But we know that rejoicing is not something that can be simply commanded by an imperative. We cannot make ourselves happy, at least not in any lasting and more deeply satisfying, deeply spiritual way. In my experience, authentic joy is fruit of a real encounter with Jesus. And I think St. John the Baptist knew this too. Last week, I said that I would, last Last Sunday of Advent, I said that I would talk about St. John the Baptist's humility and detachment from worldly things. John, the precursor, is still in focus in this third Sunday of Advent. St. John the Baptist is not only the bridge between the Old and the New Testament, as I said on the second Sunday, but he's also a bridge to Jesus Christ, not a barrier, but a bridge. And I also mentioned there that John was not portrayed as the most lighthearted of characters in the Gospels. But this needs to be clarified. When some of the Baptist's own followers came to meet him, upset that people were turning to Jesus instead of John, this is what he said. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him, the friend of the bridegroom, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. In the encounter with Jesus, the Lamb of God, John's joy is complete and he rejoices in his word. Perhaps John had a magnificat of his own as his spirit rejoiced in God, his Saviour. Speaking of the magnificat, Take care not to miss this Sunday's psalm. Rarely do we have a reading from the Holy Gospel in place of the psalm. You might notice it. Today we proclaim together Mary's wonderful Magnificat. My soul glorifies the Lord or magnifies the Lord. But the response that we give to the psalm itself is taken from our friend, the prophet Isaiah, in the first reading. My soul rejoices in my God. In fact, we might call the first reading Isaiah's own Magnificat. After all, St. Paul reminds us in the second reading not to treat the prophecies with contempt, and Isaiah is surely one of these prophecies. At the birth of St. John the Baptist, his own father, Zechariah, also had his song of rejoicing, which Luke describes as an act of prophecy. We know it as the Benedictus after the first word. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited his people and redeemed them. John the Baptist will be great. He will turn many people to God, the angel announced to Zechariah. He is a witness, says John the Evangelist. He is a witness to speak for the light so that everyone might believe through him. But he was not the light. St. John the Baptist is a bridge to Jesus and never a barrier. And herein lies his humility and detachment from worldly things. 
Everything he does, everything he says is for God. To make ready a people prepared to meet God. More earthly pursuits and more normal ways of living pale in significance to the joy of encountering Jesus for John the Baptist. Have you in in your life been able to act as someone's bridge to God? Heaven forbid we act as a barrier, but we know that Christians in their grumpiness or unchristian deeds can, can sometimes stop people from opening up to God. Sometimes our hypocrisy or maybe even our mediocrity divert people from seeing faith as worthwhile. But John the Baptist, he comes up a lot in the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, more than Mary, the mother of Jesus, and a whole lot more than many of the disciples. In a, mar- in a manner parallel to Jesus' own question to his disciples, who do people say that I am? People ask John in today's Gospel, who are you? John could enjoy the limelight here. He could claim credit for himself. This is especially true since Mark's gospel says that all Judea and all the people of Jerusalem made their way to him to be baptised. In humility, John turns enthusiasts away from any cult of the personality towards the one who is coming after him. It's as if he said, if you think I'm great, I'm not even worthy to undo undo the sandal strap of the one coming after me. Isaiah's prophecy in the first reading, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring the good news. This prophecy is also true for John the Baptist in some way. For the angel said to his priestly father, Zechariah, even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's talking of John the Baptist here. In fact, the church has always always seen not only in Mary a privileged birth, the Immaculate Conception, of course, but also in the prophet Jeremiah and in the prophet John the Baptist. Later in his ministry, Jesus will say something rather startling about John. Of all those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. In all of this, In all of this high praise, John will say, I am not the Christ. He doesn't claim credit for himself, nor remain in the limelight when Jesus comes. His whole ministry is summed up in those sublime words. He must increase and I must decrease. So what did John do? What was so great about John? None greater than John the Baptist, Jesus said. I think it's safe to say that it wasn't just because Jesus, he was Jesus' relative. According to the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, it seems that John was indispensable, a necessary preparation so that others would come to believe in Jesus. The prophecy of Malachi was that Elijah's second coming had to precede the first coming of the Messiah. Did you know that these are the very last words of the Old Testament and Christian Bibles before the Gospels begin, that Elijah would precede the Messiah, the day of the Lord? In humility, perhaps, the Baptist doesn't see himself as the prophet Elijah. Yet Jesus certainly interprets him to represent Elijah who had come before him. And that's If that's Jesus' interpretation, then it's good enough for me. We cannot know what it would have been like if John the Baptist had not paved the way for Jesus. But it's incredible, don't you think, how time and time again in history, God uses mere human beings as his instruments and as his messengers to get through to us. And I love those words of St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body on now on earth but yours. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. We all have a job to do, and there's hope for all of us. For once God even spoke through a donkey. In God's mysterious ways, he commissions others to lead us to God and in turn sends us out to lead others to God. He needs bridges to Christ 
and not barriers like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a bridge. To be sure, we must not take care. We must, we must take care not to confuse bridges for barriers, not get them mixed up. Church teaching, for example, is not a barrier, even if some think it is. Church teaching is not a barrier to, to Christ. It's, it's only a barrier if it goes unexplained or misunderstood. There's no bridge to Christ if we destroy the bridge. There's no bridge into Christ's church if we get rid of everything we stand for. This is a call to give way to Christ and to let go of our ego and our over-attachment to worldly pursuits and material things, even our attachment to being right. We don't have to all eat locusts, although I hear they're a delicacy in some parts of the world, <laughs> nor do we have to wear a hair shirt. We may already have enough irritating people in our lives for that. But imagine, imagine how peaceful and happy the world would be if all of us lived by John's motto, he must increase and I must decrease.